Rod, I did my PhD in brain science because I want to know how the brain works. So I studied anatomy and physiology and biochemistry. But what I didn't do at the time, because it was so many decades ago, is really deal with artificial intelligence and learn what you can understand about the physiological brain from the progress we've made with AI. What have we learned and what can, how can we apply it to biological systems? Well, we've learned a lot of stuff about how to build intelligent systems that can operate in the world, but I'm not sure we've answered exactly how the brain is. You know, the brain evolved over time, and looking at the brain, you have to really look at how it came over eons and eons. And all the sorts of things, the tools you talked about for looking at brains, to me, that, 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 that's like looking at transistors, and you've got a modern computer, mm -hmm. and you put a few electrodes yeah. in, and you're trying to understand mm -hmm. the C programming language from yeah. that. Yeah. It, it, it's a very hard shift to make. But I think what artificial intelligence has given us is a way of doing the stuff at that higher level, propagates down on the silicon instead of wet stuff that's mm -hmm. in our brains. And so at least we have some ideas of what sorts of things might happen. Whether we've got anything like what's really happening in the brain is a very different question, I think. Okay, so w what are some of those ways that we can, it's kind of a cognitive science approach to see what kind of cognitive modules are in the brain, however they're expressed in the wetness of neurons or synapses or whatever's going on in the brain. What are the analogs in AI? Well, there's various flavors of AI. The flavor that I yeah. follow tries to take some of those cognitive modules that we've discovered, really coming from two ways. One is looking at, um, over evolutionary time, what things are common in different animals, and then trying to say, ah, there's a module uh. that uh, uh, directs eye gaze, or you know, where my eyes are pointing. And that we can see that that module might be a way of describing things. And then we look at individuals, maybe infants, and see over time how they develop their mm. eye gaze control. Mm. So early on, infants' eye gaze is just looking at their mothers. Mm. Later, when their mother looks at something else in the world, mm -hmm. they start to think, oh, she's looking somewhere mm -hmm. else, and their <laughs> eyes go, what's mm -hmm. going on? And then a little later, they start to look in the direction her eyes are looking, uh, uh. and just a little later than that, they jump directly from estimating the gaze direction, they even estimate the divergence in the, in the two eyes, wow. and they jump directly to where the mother's uh, looking. Uh. So we see those developments happen in the individual, and that gives us some clues about what we might be able to build in a machine, and then we build in the machine, and it works surprisingly well. So rather than thinking about it in terms of the, the symbolism of the, of, 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 uh, of the machine itself, you're thinking about it in terms of these cognitive modules, and trying to find those cognitive modules from the phylogeny of, of evolution, or the, uh, the, the development of the individual over time, so you can really get different ways of triangulating these, uh, these cognitive modules. Yes, and then my version of, of, of AI then puts a whole bunch of those together yeah, uh -huh. um, and lets them interact in real time. And out of that emerges what to the outside observer is a different level of, of operation in the world. And, ha and, and the platform that you have it on, whatever the, mic the, 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 the electronic structure of it is, is kind of irrelevant. You're just trying yeah, to down at, down at, the, down at the, 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 yeah, the physical implementation of, the, of those switches or mm -hmm. pulses or whatever do doesn't matter. You've noted that vision is something that in the early days of AI people thought was sort of easy and obvious and turned out to be one of the most difficult. Yeah, you know, back in, in the early 50s when AI was sort of getting underway, in yeah. 1956 was the, the year that the words artificial intelligence oh. really got connected to a, a, a discipline. Um, the, there were 12 people at a conference up in, in, in Dartmouth, New yeah. Hampshire, where they spent a, a bunch of weeks talking about artificial intelligence. And out of that came a set of key problems to work on to get to the essence of intelligence. And they were things like proving theorems, playing chess. Now, looking back on that, I think that maybe be being good at proving theorems and playing chess was what differentiated those people from ordinary people. <laughs> so that must be the essence of intelligence. <laughs> but vision was viewed, yeah. oh, anyone can do, do that, vision. Right. Vision must be easy. In fact, at MIT in 1966, 
some of those founders of the field 10 years later. So, oh, we've got to solve the vision problem once and for all. So they had a summer vision project, <laughs> and they put a sophomore, who's now a, a, a professor at MIT, right. or a very right. senior person, they put a sophomore in charge of solving vision <laughs> over the summer. <laughs> and 50-some uh, years later, when we're, we're not close to the set of goals that they set up in May to mm. plan to have finished by August. So as some common people know, you can have robots that can do incredible things on automobile assembly lines or lift heavy th things, but to have the visionary capability of a two-year-old to look at a table and pick out maybe a sunglass from a, from a radio is still very difficult. Yes, if you get a two-year-old and you show them um, a, 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 a key, you know, it might be a different shaped key than they've ever seen before. They don't say that's a key. Yeah. You show them a cup, and they've never seen a, that particular sort of cup. You know, it may have, yeah. may have a clowns on it or yeah. something. They've never seen it. That's a cup. Yeah. And uh, if you do this experiment with two-year-olds, they sort of think, why is this person asking me these dumb questions? Right. It's a key. <laughs> yeah. It's a cup. And they can do that effortlessly. Our computer vision algorithms have gotten a lot better since around 1995. There's been a, a very steady increase in performance. And we can recognize particular objects, but they're all image-based. So if I show you the computer vision system, the Model 1000 coffee maker, mm -hmm. it says it's a Model 1000 coffee maker. And this is the Model 1500 yeah, coffee right. maker. But if I show it a hammer, it says, I don't know whether that's the Model 2000 or the Model 1000 yeah. coffee maker. <laughs> it doesn't own any fundamental difference. From, from it's, it's coffee all, makers, yeah. It's, yeah. All, it's all just image matching. Yeah. And we've yeah. got computers speed and the algorithms have gotten really good at that, yeah. which lets us do a lot of practical things out in the world. What are the implications of that for the human brain and, and uh, cognitive systems? I mean, wh what does that tell you about the capabilities of, of the uh, biological brains? Our, our failure to have robust computer vision, as robust as a two-year-old child, tells me we still haven't figured out the basic way that animals even yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, we've, we've figured out certain sorts of things, um, image flow and navigation from image flow. Uh, we've, gotten, we've gotten pretty good at that. But object recognition, I don't think we've, we've cracked at all yet. And so that would mean that the way biological systems do that, animals, two-year-old children, uh, we don't know yet. I mean, it, it, it's clearly not some linear, simple pattern recognition. Over time, lots of people have thought they've got the answer, and you can sort of trace <laughs> over history when particular fads came on. This is the answer. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it was perceptrons or radial basis functions or support vector machines or some other string yeah. of words, <laughs> yeah. this is going to solve it all. Yeah. And I've become a little jaded about seeing those. I'm still waiting. At, at some point, someone's got to get it right, <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. Do you see a cross-pollination between the biological sciences and, and, and the great advances in the neurosciences and the attempts in, in, in AI to develop at the same time? Are there cross-pollinations or each one really developing on their own? There's tremendous cross-pollination happening now. Um, and some, sometimes I think it leads various disciplines astray because <laughs> people take analogies from the numbers right. when they perhaps push them too hard. But uh, the, the, there is tremendous uh, cross-pollination. All, all the way from just uh, finding sequences in genomes and finding common patterns and finding preservation over evolutionary scales uh, using um, matching algorithms that were originally developed to match speech uh, mm -hmm. strings, for instance, that's gone back and forth with, with uh, DNA matching, so those linear sorts of matching problems, to um, psychophysical experiments that people are doing in their labs with with babies and elucidating what the modules might be. Um, going into AI and AI building those sorts of systems and then saying, well, there's a problem here and that goes back. Oh, Can we do uh, the experiment which yeah. elucidates what's really going on? Now, I think, though, we may get a little, we're a little too engineering centric in a lot of scientific thinking in that we think about there being modules per se. Well. Evolution didn't necessarily design a module and perfect it. <laughs> Evolution is willing to do any mucky yeah. thing that <laughs> happens to be a local advantage. Right. And when you do lots of hill climbing over little murky, mucky things, you get a mess sometimes. <laughs> a mess that works, but uh, maybe not as clean as our engineering minds would like to ha be able to describe it. So you would see in the future that AI could be a cleaner 
by uh, intelligence than a uh, the what evolution created in biology. It may be, or or and there's a lot of people in a in a discipline called artificial life, who are trying to evolve systems mm. to see whether they can sort of re rerun the, mm. the the tape of evolution, yeah. and and see if we can come up with systems that are able to adapt to a complex world in the same way biological systems are. Our, our computational systems are nowhere near as robust or adaptive as even simple biological systems.